Two summers ago, my family and I decided to take a much-needed vacation. We rented a charming house in a small remote town, hoping for a peaceful getaway. The first day was perfect, exploring local attractions, enjoying the nearby lake, and savoring dinner at a quaint, family-owned restaurant. As the evening set in, we decided to explore the town a bit more, and stumbled upon a small local fair. The fair was winding down, but we caught sight of a tractor pull about to begin. It seemed like a fun way to end our first day, so we joined the small crowd gathered on the bleachers. Families were scattered around, though there were also a few rowdy individuals who had clearly had too much to drink. Still, with my 16-year-old son and a good friend by my side, I felt safe. We decided to leave before the event ended and made our way back to the vacation rental. I noticed a car pulling out from the fairground behind us as we drove off. It followed us down the narrow, winding roads leading away from the town. At first, I didn't think much of it. Maybe they were tourists like us, staying in one of the vacation homes nearby. But as the miles passed, the car remained right on our tail, even as we turned onto increasingly desolate roads. The sun had set by now, and darkness blanketed the countryside. I began to feel uneasy. The car wasn't just following us, it was tailgating, staying uncomfortably close no matter how fast or slow I drove. My unease grew with every curve of the road. The headlights in my rearview mirror seemed to loom larger, more menacing. Desperate to shake this unwanted follower, I sped up, hoping to reach a main road or even the interstate. But the car matched my speed, refusing to back off. My friend, sitting in the passenger seat, suggested we stop at the next gas station, but I knew the nearest one was miles away. I didn't want to risk pulling over on this isolated road with my son in the back seat. As we finally approached the interstate, I hoped that the car would peel off, that this unnerving chase was just a strange coincidence. But the car followed us onto the interstate, still right on my bumper. I felt a wave of fear wash over me. What did this person want? Why were they so intent on keeping up with us? I sped up, but the car stayed with us, its headlights a constant, glaring presence in the rearview mirror. The interstate was eerily quiet, and my heart raced as I realized we were virtually alone on this stretch of road. My friend clenched his fists, ready to confront whoever was behind us if it came to that, but I wasn't willing to take that risk, not with my son in the car. In a desperate attempt to signal that we were not to be messed with, I honked the horn repeatedly. To my surprise, the car behind us suddenly pulled over to the shoulder, its headlights cutting off. Relief flooded over me, but it was short-lived. What if they were planning something even worse? We drove on, the tension in the car thick enough to cut with a knife. After what felt like an eternity, we began to see other cars on the road, and for a moment, I allowed myself to believe we were in the clear. But then, out of nowhere, the headlights of that same car flared back on, right beside us. I gasped. It had been following us the whole time, its lights off, lurking in the darkness, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. This time, the driver was more aggressive, swerving towards us, trying to push us off the road. I pushed the accelerator to the floor, racing towards the faint lights of a distant truck. The truck driver, sensing something was wrong, swerved into the fast lane, cutting off the pursuing car and giving us a chance to escape. We took the opportunity and sped away, eventually pulling into a well-lit gas station where a police officer was stationed. My friend explained everything to the officer, who immediately called for backup to search for the mysterious car. We were shaken but safe, and I decided to leave my car at the gas station overnight, not wanting to lead this potential danger back to our rental home. For weeks after that night, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. Every white sedan that passed by made my heart skip a beat. But the most unsettling thought of all was that this small, quiet town, where we had hoped to find peace, was home to one of the largest mental health asylums in the Midwest. I still check the news from that area, wondering if our tormentor was ever found, or if they're still out there, waiting for their next victim. Enjoying the content? Subscribe now for more.
As my wife and I set out for our long-awaited vacation, the excitement was palpable. We'd rented a cozy cottage by a serene lake, nestled deep within the mountains, a perfect escape from the city's hustle. The road ahead was one we'd never traveled, a winding path through the heart of the countryside. It's beautiful out here, Carol remarked, her eyes reflecting the vibrant hues of early autumn. Leaves of crimson and gold fluttered past our windows, and the sky was a flawless shade of robin's egg blue. We had a picnic basket in the back seat, and plans to spend our first evening watching the sunset over the water. As we drove along the unfamiliar route, a toll booth suddenly loomed ahead. It was an odd sight, a solitary structure in the middle of nowhere. Did the rental company mention a toll road? I asked, rummaging through the cup holder for change. I don't think so, Carol replied, checking her purse. Between us we managed to scrounge up only 35 cents. The toll was 50 cents. Must be a small maintenance fee for the road, I mused, but we're short on change. We'd recently emptied our coin jar to help fund the trip, forgetting to set aside coins for situations like this. Maybe we can go around, Carol suggested, nodding toward the narrow shoulder. The booth was unmanned, and the wooden barrier didn't look particularly sturdy. I hesitated but then shrugged. I suppose it won't hurt just this once. Carefully, I steered the car onto the soft shoulder, maneuvering around the barrier. As we passed, I felt a slight twinge at the back of my neck, a fleeting sense of unease that I quickly dismissed. We shared a laugh over our minor act of rebellion, the toll booth disappearing behind us. The road stretched on, and the scenery grew even more picturesque. Carol leaned her head out the window, her hair catching the breeze. The trees look almost too perfect, don't they?" she remarked. I glanced around and noticed what she meant. The foliage seemed unusually vibrant, the colors almost too vivid, like a high-definition photograph. After about 30 minutes, we approached another toll booth identical to the first. That's strange, I muttered. Why would there be another one? Maybe it's for different sections of the road, Carol suggested, though uncertainty tinged her voice. We searched again for change but came up empty-handed. Deciding to repeat our earlier tactic, I navigated around the barrier once more. This time, the uneasy feeling lingered a bit longer. I have a weird feeling about this, Carol admitted as we continued down the road. The trees now seemed almost surreal, their colors intensifying to unnatural shades. The leaves looked glossy, almost artificial and the sky had taken on a peculiar hue. It's probably just the mountain air messing with our senses, I said trying to sound convincing, but deep down, I shared her unease. Another thirty minutes passed, and to our disbelief, a third toll booth appeared ahead, identical in every way to the previous two. This can't be right, I whispered, a knot forming in my stomach. Before I could respond, the car sputtered, and the engine died. I tried the ignition but it refused to start. What's going on? I muttered, frustration giving way to fear. The road behind us was empty, and our phones had lost signal miles back. As I contemplated our next move, a movement caught my eye. The door of the toll booth was slowly opening. Emerging from the booth was a figure that sent a chill down my spine. It was humanoid but disturbingly distorted, its limbs too long, its head too small and its skin stretched taut like wax over bone. Its eyes were dark and unblinking, fixed directly on us. We need to get out of here, Carol whispered, gripping my arm tightly. I tried the ignition again in vain. The figure moved with an unnatural gait, closing the distance between us. It reached the driver's side window and tapped lightly. Its fingers were elongated, ending in sharp points. Toll, please. It said in a voice that sounded like wind whispering through cracks. My heart pounded as I fumbled for my wallet, pulling out a crumpled dollar bill. With trembling hands I pressed it against the window. The creature tilted its head, a grotesque smile spreading across its face to reveal rows of jagged teeth. Slowly, it reached out and placed its hand over the dollar. To my horror, its fingers phased through the glass as if it weren't there, grasping the bill. Toll accepted. It hissed, 
its voice echoing unnaturally. As suddenly as it had died, the car roared back to life. The creature stepped back, gesturing for us to proceed. Not wasting a second, I slammed my foot on the accelerator. We sped away, the toll booth and its guardian shrinking in the rearview mirror. We drove in silence, the surreal landscape gradually returning to normal. The trees regained their natural hues, and the sky cleared. When we finally reached the cottage, neither of us felt the relief we'd anticipated. Maybe we should head back home, Carol suggested softly. I nodded, unable to shake the lingering dread. The allure of the secluded vacation had vanished, replaced by an overwhelming desire to be anywhere but here. The next morning, we took a different route out of the mountains, avoiding any unfamiliar roads. Even now, back in the comfort of our home, the memory of that day lingers. We make sure to keep change in the car at all times, and we've agreed to steer clear of remote toll roads. Some shortcuts just aren't worth the cost. My family and I decided to move from our old apartment in Chicago to the quiet countryside of North Carolina. According to my parents, life was much simpler there. They had grown tired of the city's hustle and bustle, and, as they got older, became more attached to the peacefulness of the rural landscape. At the time, the cost of plane tickets was incredibly high, and we didn't have much money to spare. Because of this, my parents decided that we would drive from Illinois all the way to North Carolina. It was a long drive, but considering the number of road trips we had taken over the years, it was definitely doable. Anyway, we packed everything up and began the 12-hour drive to Asheville about two hours outside of Charlotte. It was a long journey, but we were about halfway through and weren't about to give up. If I remember correctly, we were driving on a road somewhere in Virginia or Maryland that stretched across the state. It was around 2 a.m. when I woke up, feeling the car slowly coming to a stop. As I awoke, I asked my dad why we had stopped, and that's when I noticed what appeared to be a person lying in the middle of the road. Right then, I realized it was a woman, maybe in her late thirties, with brown hair and wearing a jacket. At this point, my parents were confused and worried. My dad told us to stay in the car as he began to get out. With my dad being ex-law enforcement, his instinct was to help the person in need or prepare for the worst. My mom and I watched as my dad approached the woman still lying face down on the pavement. When he turned her over, he immediately stepped back. It was a bit hard to see, but we could tell my dad started panicking and ran back to the car, where he quickly drove off. I only managed to take a brief glance at her as we sped by, and what I saw made me understand why my dad was so scared. The only way I could describe her face was that it looked distorted, her eyes bulging, her jaw misaligned and her right arm twisted behind her. It was a scene where I didn't think any human was even capable of doing this to someone. The only thing my dad saw that could possibly give an explanation was a red circle spray-painted on the road beside her. We had no idea what it meant or who had put it there, but my family believes it was a symbol to represent a group of killers. I know, crazy theory, right? But can you blame us? It took another two hours before we reached the next town, where my dad was able to file a police report. We didn't know the exact location of the incident other than it being on a road in the middle of nowhere. I'm not sure if the proper authorities took action or not, but I'd like to think they did and opened an investigation. Three months later, I was scrolling through Reddit when I came across a post that focused on disappearances and theories. I'm into the mystery behind that kind of stuff, so I found it interesting. The post I was looking at had multiple photos and videos of theories and clues as to how or why these people might have disappeared. I ended up landing on one of the photos that had something that looked eerily familiar. And that's when I saw the red circle. The same red circle I had seen on the road that night. This time, someone had taken a picture of one spray painted on the side of a barn. The title of the post read something like, Found this symbol during a hike. The thread was full of replies and comments with theories about who might have done this. Everything from the Zodiac Killer to ritualistic sacrifices from a cult. There was even a comment about how it could be the work of some secret society. The most common theory, though, was that they were just another group of killers nicknamed the Circle Killers. 
All of these theories were plausible, but I wasn't going to dig for the most likely explanation. My family never received an update about the incident, and we aren't expecting one. If anyone has more information about the circle killers, please inform people about them.